I'm Gigi again, and um, this is our talk. Um, so as the topic suggests, we'll be talking a little bit technically today, um, but I think that we're all developers or developers want to be, so it should be fine. So today we want to share our experiences and lessons learned by building on StarkNet. We'll start with our company mission and our approach towards the mission, and then we'll recount what we did for the last 12 months since we began building on StarkNet roughly last September, then what we learned from what we built and what we think should happen next. <clears throat> so our mission is we think that verifiable computation or the stuff that I talked about, the, the huge white clause where if anyone lies, then you will see a blot. Uh, that dark magic technology is going to be one of the driving forces that transform how society functions in the future. And we want to be a company that help drive that force towards a good direction. So our approach is uh, we have this um, hypothesis that we actually don't know what the future holds for us. And uh, to paraphrase Brett Victor, um, he has the saying that if we can admit that we don't know, then we are free. We become free and we can do anything. We can experiment with anything. So that's our approach. We want to experiment with a lot of different things. Particularly, we want to build game-like applications instead of financial applications because game applications allows us to explore different sensory modalities at different aspects of you know, multiplayer matchmaking, uh, interactivity, client building, and so on and so forth, while bearing very little risk. As in, if you build financial applications, you're bearing risk. But if you do game like application, you can experiment with a lot of things, but bear little risk. And we think it's important to experiment with different things this way. So what we did starting last uh, September, October, is we started out by building some AI on, the, on, on, on StarkNet. Right? So there's this notion that blockchain is a platform that computes things autonomously. And so we think it's a perfect medium to put autonomous agents on the blockchain. And StarkNet gives us a lot of compute. And so why, not, why don't build AIs on, on, on StarkNet? So this is a queue learning agent, uh, the, a very vanilla construction of reinforcement learning, an agent that plays the tic-tac-toe game. And so this agent is trained off-chain, offline, in a Python environment. And then the trained agent is converted via a script into Cairo smart contracts and deployed on StarkNet. Also with the tic-tac-toe game also written in Cairo. And so the result is that you can go to StarkNet, you can make a move um, on the tic-tac-toe board and the AI will compute a counter move um, in Cairo and return the board back to you. And so you can basically play the game with AI where the AI lives on the StarkNet. And then I think it makes sense to go to a neural network. Well, machine learning is a, uh, has a long winding history, and neural networks are wonderful because they're super expressive, and they can learn things along a continuous curve. And so we started with basically the neural network 101, which is a DNN that trained on the MNIST data set. MNIST is a data set with a bunch of handwritten digits, 0 to 9. And so what this AI does is you give it a vector of a handwritten digit, and it predicts or it classifies the input along 0 to 9. Basically, you try to identify which digit it is. So what's happening on Cairo is that the model was trained in PyTorch, just industry standard, and then the model was converted into a bunch of Cairo smart contracts that together can perform the model inference. And the contracts are deployed on StarkNet, and so when you call the contract function and give it a vector, which is the handwritten digit, it will compute on StarkNet and gives you the result, whether it's a 0 to 9 or anything between. And then we pivoted a little bit. So we pivoted from AI to physics. Because when you think about video games, video games are this physical environments, well, simulated physical environments with AIs moving um, along with human players. Right? Every NPC is an AI. And so we started to play, ha had a lot of fun in the physics simulation where physics simulation essentially is trying to numerically simulate the evolution of a physics system. Um, so on the left, you have a couple rigid bodies constrained by springs, right? And so they will oscillate um, you know, relative to each other. 
And on the right, you have a two-body system. And these two bodies live on the same 2D plane, and they're constrained by the, the gravitational law. So what's happening in Cairo is uh, we use Cairo to program the um, integration of the differential equations that describe the physics system. Right? So for, for spring-constrained object, the differential equation is super simple. Right? It's mass and acceleration equals the, uh, the, the force of the spring, which is uh, basically proportional to displacement. Right? This is like uh, uh, junior high school physics. And on the right, um, you have gravitational system, Newton's gravitational law, uh, which is inverse square law. And so we basically, in Cairo, program a numerical method that allows us to compute how the system evolves over time according to these forces and these gravities uh, properties. So we, we did two-body problem. Uh, so why don't we do four, a four-body problem? Right? So three-body problem is this uh, Chinese uh, sci-fi novel that inspired us uh, very much. And so this is the kind of the toy example of a three-body problem. So you have three suns and a pale blue dot on the right, which is, which is the planet. So imagine a solar system with three suns, and it's super chaotic, and you have a planet that is revolving around the suns. So we wrote the Cairo that allows us to simulate the evolution of a four-body problem, or constrained four-body problem, three plus one. Um, and this is a PDF file, but originally the demo was an, was a, was an animation. And then we started to go towards more of a traditional game engine uh, direction. So this is a very simple 2D rigid body simulation where circles are, bo are bouncing um, within a axis aligned um, bounding box AABV, which is just a square, basically a rectangle environment. Um, and uh, the balls can collide with each other and momentum conserve when they're colliding, a you know, fully elastic collision. And uh, so what, what happens in Cairo is the entire physics simulation. Right, so uh, every, all the computations are done in, on StarkNet. So when the client listens to StarkNet, the client receives the coordinates of everything over time. The, the, so the client basically visualizes the state of the objects, but all the computations happen on StarkNet. And then we pivoted again. So we've done some rudimentary AI and, and we, did some, we did some physics we became interested in testing the boundary of putting uh, 3D models on blockchain. Right? So there's all this history of on-chain NFT traded on Ethereum layer one, and people started doing different kinds of on-chain SVGs, uh, procedural generated SVGs, and the more on-chain these NFTs are, and the more sort of premium they're traded at because of the on-chain on maximalist uh, position. But, but those are 2Ds, right? SVGs allows you to represent 2D image. What about 3D? So uh, a designer friend designed these Axi creatures in a 3D format. So this is GLTF, which is one of the dominant standards for 3D models. And then we transformed the GLTF file into Kairosmon contract that represents the 3D model. And we deploy that model on StarkNet so that if you read the function on StarkNet, it will give you um, a byte string which you, can, which, which you can perfectly recover the original GLTF model, and you can plug it into Blender, you can plug it into the standard GLTF viewer, and you can, you can see the 3D model. You can recover, fully recover the 3D model. And then, so we did visual, so let's go to audio, right? It's just different modality. So this is our experiment where we put a MIDI file on StarkNet, right? The MIDI file is just uh, a very simple but expressive file format to represent audio file. So we put a MIDI file on, we, we wrote a script that transformed a MIDI, media, uh, MIDI file into Kairos smart contracts. But not, not only that, we injected hooks into the contract so that when you call the function, you can supply as input a tempo multiplier. Right? So if you can supply like, in, in this demo, you can supply 2.66 as a tempo multiplier, and it will give you back the MIDI file, only that the, the music is sped up by 2.66 times. And uh, so you can change the tempo by using the view function. And as you know, view functions on blockchains are free, for free. So essentially, we're kind of providing a service for free on the blockchain, but on StarkNet. Um, and not only changing tempo, we have a separate experiment where you can 
upshift and downshift the key of the MIDI file. So again, you call the view function, you, you plug an input, you, you supply the uh, keys, whether it's a positive or negative, and it'll give you the MIDI file, and you can play it to standard MIDI player uh, local on your machine, and it will be the shifted version of the original music. So then we, uh, we went back to physics. So, so we have 2D rigid body stuff colliding with each other. Let's make a tiny game with it. And so this is the billiard game where players are supposed to poke at the white ball, and the white ball bounces around the scene with colliding with other balls. And the rule of the game is the colored ball will give you different score when you collide with it. But the gray ball will reset your score back to zero when you collide with it. All right, so the game's simple. You're supposed to find a direction and a force so that you can maximize your score. And, and there's friction, so everything comes to rest uh, eventually. And you want to maximize your score at the end. Uh, a very simple game, but uh, in, the entire logic is running on StarkNet. What's happening off-chain is the visualization. So client basically rece received score, conditions, state of the physics system, and, and renders it visually. And then we evolved this into a concept called soft to mint. So the idea here is that can we have a token that's not tradable? Um, it's only earnable by solving a puzzle. And because if you can solve a puzzle, um, the token basically represents that you have knowledge about solving the puzzle. So we can have a token that's not tradable, only earnable by solving a puzzle. So let's solve a puzzle to mint a token. And we can constrain that each puzzle will emit a a unique token, so you cannot solve the puzzle twice. You, have, you want to be competing with other people to solve puzzles before everyone else. So this concept can be applied to a DAO, right? So imagine a DAO where the token is earnable by solving puzzles, instead of, instead of the status quo, where you can buy DAO tokens on public market. So you can do coin voting by swaying the direction of the DAO. But if you apply soft mint to a DAO, you can say this DAO is gated on people having knowledge of the puzzle. So if you, have, if you have math puzzle, you can create a math DAO, where you know that people joining the DAO have solved math puzzles, and so on, and so forth. And you can create a physics DAO, right, where the puzzles are the physics puzzles. Um, and then we, we did another soft mint. So this soft mint uh, is a different kind of puzzle. It is a puzzle where you're supposed to draw a continuous path through different numbers. And uh, whenever you pass through the circle, you're supposed to go st straight. When you're passing through the square, you're supposed to turn a corner. And there are additional constraints, but basically the idea is finding a path that satisfies all the constraints. And we have 50 different puzzles, so different configurations, 50 of them, each puzzle emitting only one solver. And if it, if it is solved, it is solved. It's gone. So it gives you a ticket when you solve it. And uh, one account can solve at most one puzzle. And so unless you cyber attack this puzzle, uh, with 50 puzzles, we can get 50 different people or different accounts. And the reason why we did this is because we want to have playtesters. And so we built a game called Isaac, which is a three-body problem game, um, and the soft mint. And this puzzle basically is the mechanism that we're getting playtesters to help us playtest the alpha of the game. And the game is a three-body problem game, game, again, where we have three suns, and we have a tiny planet that is revolving around the suns. And you can imagine if the planet crashes into a sun, then everyone dies. So it's a very hostile environment to live in, right? unlike our solar system. A solar system with three suns is pretty hostile. And so the players have to work together to pilot their planet around and away from the disaster. And the, the, the way would, they would do it is all the players are playing a resource management game on the planet. So resource management is basically you build factories and pipelines and generators by harvesting resources. You know, kind of like Age of Empire or any kind of real-time strategy game, right? You're base building and transforming natural resources into stuff with you know, strategic purposes. Um, and ultimately, players are building engines. And these engines are like rockets where if you launch the rocket, you are kicking the planet in reverse. And so players can do this and pilot the planet around the suns. And finally, we became enamored with uh, different game, game mechanics. So this is basically a fighting game. Right? So fighting game, if it's a 2D fighting game, you have characters in a 2D scene with some physics at work, like right? gravity, 
friction and so on. And these characters can perform different moves, defensive move, uh, 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 you know, locomotion, attack, and so on, and they're interacting with each other. Um, below, you can see hitboxes, right? So if you play fighting game, you know hitboxes are where the game determines if something is colliding with something else, if my punch is colliding with your body, and so on and so forth. Um, so we, we, we uh, built a fighting game experiment on StarkNet. The, the key here is this fighting game is not played by keyboard where players sort of mechanically remember move sets and key combos. Uh, this game is played between AIs. So uh, I'm sure for Ethereum developers, you know uh, Zero X Monaco, which is a game by Paradigm as a racing game where the race cars are AIs. And so to play the game, you have to submit a Solidity smart contract or a compiled uh, bytecode. And on the game backend, they will match make all the different uh, uh, race car AIs and determine the outcome. This game is similar, but um, the game mechanics is not a racing game, it's a uh, fighting game. So what's happening on StarkNet is everything except visual, right? So everything means that frame by frame, the Cairo smart contract would um, run each of the AIs, where AI basically takes the environmental stimulus, make some uh, do some decision making and output an action. Action may be uh, the character move forward, backward, jump, you know, perform various kind of um, you know, attack and defen defensive actions. And then the smart contract would then sort of uh, simulate the interaction between these characters' action in a, in, in a physics sense, right? So it would say, well, if character one is attacking character two, it, and whether the hitbox and hurtboxes are colliding. Basically, the, the, the fighting game uh, basic mechanics. So every one of these simulations is on-chain. So what's off-chain is just the visualization, the visual aspect. Right, so that's um, everything we did for the last 12 months. And so we've learned a couple of things I'd like to share with you today. Uh, the first thing is, um, as on-chain maximalists, we're constantly playing with this idea, this idea called CCB. We're calling it the chain climb boundary uh, barrier, this barrier between blockchain and client. Right, so if you look at OpenSea, OpenSea is an NFT marketplace. And it has a front end, it has a back end maintained by the company. And then NFT contracts are on, on, on blockchain. And people criticize OpenSea by, for being centralized because whenever you look at the marketplace, you're looking at the centralized database. You're not looking directly on the blockchain. And so that's how they deal with this, the, the barrier, by having a backend to organize everything from the blockchain. And so the front end is efficient. The front end talks to the back end only. But then, as on-chain maximalists, we want to explore ways to decentralize further by talking more directly to the blockchain, or to StarkNet in this case. And it's re really difficult, right? So for financial applications, you, you may have ledgers that says account one owns how much token, account two owns how much token, and so on. But for a full-blown on-chain game, you have a state of the entire world, coordinates, right? different objects moving, uh, different characters have their health points, properties, you know, equipment, and so on. That's a lot of state. And how would you transport all these on-chain state to the client through the barrier? That is, is always a tricky problem. Uh, another lesson we've learned is this is the pattern we use. So we don't directly transport the blockchain state through the barrier. We, we transport through event emission. So if you code in Cairo or Solidity as well, you can emit event from the smart contract. So what we did is we emit events that communicates what has changed on the blockchain. And so on the client side, if you listen to the events, you can recover everything. You can reconstruct the, um, every single state from the blockchain uh, without having to talk to, uh, communicate directly with the blockchain. And basically, the programming model here is very functional. It's, it's a functional programming model where you have state and logic separation Right? And so you can perform pure function that can allow you to fast forward states arbitrarily by decoupling state and logic. But we feel that we don't have a structural enough way or framework to do this. Functional programming are wonderful, but we, we're not using it uh, enough sufficiently on, on the blockchain programming. Uh, next lesson is obviously, so we're doing physics simulation, and these are super complex. Uh, computations, complex with respect to you know, layer one De DeFi operations, not complex with respect to you know, like commercial Unity or, or um, uh, game engine operations. Th they are super complex. 
But still, um, our kind of simulation is already complex for blockchain, and we oftentimes exceed the resource allocation for each transaction. So on, on Ethereum, right, you have this block gas limit. If, you, if your transaction uses up too, too much gas, it doesn't go through. Um, on StarkNet, there's a step count. Right now, it's 2 million step. And so if your compute, comp compute is too complex, such that it exceeds 2 million step, your transaction simply doesn't go through. Um, so we've, we've, we've been doing physics simulation, right? If you add one more physics object in the scene, you're adding a bunch of pairwise collision interaction. So we can basically very um, easily sort of play with and test out the boundary of what can be computed on chain. And so the idea here is, I think we should be able to say that um, as long as I'm willing to pay more, I can run arbitrarily complex computation. So right now, it's not the case. Right now, if I'm running something that's so complex it exceeds one transaction, what I can do is I can stay within one transaction and cache everything. And then I, I can invoke the second transaction, read everything from cache, and then, and then basically resume the computation. So I can basically chop up a, a complex things into different transactions, and I have to do the caching myself, which seems something that should be abstracted away from programmers. I should be able to just pay for my compute, however complex they are. And the system should, should handle these caching and resuming for me. And then, so obviously we've been using Yagi a lot. Uh, for those of you coming from layer one, Keeper Network, uh, Gelato, these are mechanisms that allow you to automate transaction, right? So you can go to a, uh, like a bulletin board and say, uh, whenever, whenever I raise my hand, you want, please invoke my function. So that's, that's a way to automate transaction. And um, Yagi is the automation solution on StarkNet. And Isaac, the game, relies on Yagi a lot. So basically, Isaac has this universe of suns and planets. And the uni universe steps forward in time every two blocks. So every two blocks, Yagi will come call Isaac and run a little bit of physics simulation and forward the state of the universe. But I think that, so for those of you coming from a computer architecture background, um, it's quite obvious that these sort of scheduling of jobs and automation and execution, this is very much an operating system level component. This doesn't feel like an application. This feels like a inf piece of infrastructure. But right now, Yagi is an application on StarkNet. It's not part of the infrastructure. Uh, we feel that we are lacking standards to verifiably compose function. Um, so what I mean by this? Um, so function composition, right? So if I have a function that takes in an integer and output a string, right, and I have another function that takes in a string and outputs a Boolean, I can compose these two functions right, by just chaining them together. This is just function composition, straightforward. Um, Cairo 1.0 is going to be typed, but we feel that composability on blockchain is not verifiable now. So those of you coming from layer one, we can compose ERC20 operation with another ERC20 operation, right, and so on and so forth. That's how the DeFi summer happened. Um, but in terms of ERC20 compliance, it's not automatically determined. Right? So you can say, I'm following the ERC20 spec, but then I, I will get security audit so that I, I am comfortable that my contract follows the interface. The, the compliance is not verifiable in the automatic sense. So what I'm hinting at here is that if we can put a compiler on the blockchain, we can use that compiler to enforce, to verifiably enforce that function signatures and type checks are, are, are valid. And this requires the right compiler on chain. Right, the next one is library reuse. Right? So if you use GitHub and you import Open Zeppelin libraries and you deploy your contract, you are redeploying your Open Zeppelin contracts. And so if there are 1,000 projects on StarkNet all using Open Zeppelin, then there's 1,000 identical copies of Open Zeppelin libraries. And this obviously is not good, right? So we are uh, causing state bloat on the blockchain by not reusing things, sufficiently reusing things. And for application developers, we kind of don't care, right? I feel like, well, the infrastructure people, or maybe Vitalik will, wrote a, will, will write a blog that, talk, that complains about state bloat and how we can solve it. But I, as an application developer, this is convenient. I'll just redeploy everything. Um, but there's, I think there is a serious lack of opportunity here. So if we can reuse library on chain, 
one thing can happen, which is we can value redistribute to these library makers. Right? So one of the things about open source software is that people are doing things for free. They're not, contribute, they're not compensated accordingly. Right? All the way from the last 30, 40 years of free open software development, a lot of these programmers somewhere in the world are contributing to uh, JavaScript libraries that are powering all the web apps, but they're kind of not getting paid, or they're getting like tiny donations and asking for donations on Wikipedia. Right? That's not ideal. But when we can reuse libraries on chain, we can redirect value back to these library creators in a very verifiable and transparent way, because the value distribution will also be on chain. So this is a way to power more open source software on the blockchain. And finally, we feel like the workflow is all over the place. Right, so um, you would open, open up your Visual Studio code, you have your local file system, you're using GitHub for version control, uh, you will redeploy with various different kind of command line um, um, tools, and uh, you would install you know, compilers, you will spin up a virtual environment, and so on and so forth. And once this is deployed on a blockchain, you would open up Voyager or, or Etherscan that will help you look at the blockchain. Blockchain is just this weird opaque thing somewhere, and I need to open different browser tabs running web apps to look and interact with the blockchain. But it's, it's so intangible. And the, and the workflow is all over the place, involving so many different web apps and tools. So what we think should happen next, based on all the lessons learned, um, is the following. And, and um, this is all lumped into one slide. I want to apologize for the succinctness here. Um, first thing is, we think it will be valuable to be able to distribute software from the blockchain. So imagine we can distribute JavaScript libraries from the blockchain so that web apps doesn't have to be hosted somewhere in a centralized server. Web apps can boot itself directly from the blockchain because blockchain delivers the JavaScript libraries and code that's required to run the, the client-side software. That would be super cool. Um, second point is we think it's important to run a file system on a blockchain. Right? So I think ENS, these name, different name service, uh, uh, Solana name service, Ethereum name service, they're trying to provide you with human-readable strings that represent hexadecimal addresses. And so we can extend that to a file system, right? So picture that you can picture maybe in three years, you open up a Visual Studio code, right? And in Visual Studio code, right, on the left, left side, you have a file explorer, right, a file browser. Only that each one of those files is on the blockchain. It's not on your local file system anymore. Right? Imagine a Visual Studio code that's looking directly on the, on the blockchain. And that requires running a file system directly on a blockchain and a client-side software that works with the file system. We think that's, that would be super cool. Another thing coupled with the file system is version control. So on the blockchain, everything is timestamped with hashes. So it's quite natural to do version control on a blockchain. So everything can be transparent, right? Who, changed, who contributed to what version of this contract living on a blockchain? Everything is transparent. We just have to implement some kind of uh, Git mechanism for version control in a smart contract. Number three, we think it's it will be valuable to run compilers and interpreters on the blockchain, because then we can verifiably guarantee that functions are following the law. Right, so this notion that um, if you have put some thought into on-chain game, why, why are we running video games on the blockchain at all? Right, because um, What's enforced on the blockchain is credible neutral. So if your video games has a set of constitution, you want to put that constitution on the blockchain so that no one can cheat. Right? So coming back to programming, compiler is the judge. Right? Compiler basically encapsulates what's legal and what's not legal when it comes to programming. So compiler is something that should be put on a blockchain so we can verifiably enforce that programs compile and they follow certain rules and so on and so forth. That would be a wonderful thing. Uh, next thing is, imagine having a weight in blockchain programming. We don't have it. We don't have a synchronicity in blockchain programming. A weight basically means that, imagine on StarkNet, I can write a contract, and in one line I said, a weight reading from Ethereum. And then, during execution, a small contract will halt at that line. When data comes back from Ethereum, the, the execution will continue from that line. Right now, it's impossible. Right now, everything has to happen atomically, atomically inside one transaction. And so you will have all these different weird state machines pattern to deal with things happening asynchronously. But when we can have a way, I, mean, I think it will be a superpower for blockchain programmers. 
And following that, I think it will be wonderful to do indefinite programs. So indefinite programs basically means programs that are running indefinitely. Um, like uh, you, if you open an app on your smartphone, the app just runs indefinitely un until you close it, right? Until you shut down your uh, smartphone. Right now, programs are, again, constrained by one transaction running autonomously on the blockchain. Um, if we want to run indefinite program, that basically means that we need to introduce something like a process in operating system. Right? So in, in, in operating system, you can have this different processes with different PIDs, and they're running different tasks. They're allocated with different resources. Maybe they're threading and so on. Um, we need to introduce process to blockchain so that process can carry programs that are running indefinitely. And then following that, um, coming back to the analogy of uh, the, you know, the Visual Studio Code looking at the blockchain, right, where the file browser is the on-chain file system, not your local file system. That basically means we can build an IDE, or you know, uh, interactive development uh, environment, for the blockchain, that, like, directly for the blockchain, not running IDE locally that will require you to later deploy on the blockchain. Maybe we can run IDE directly on the blockchain. And then just following that, why don't we build a graphical user interface for the blockchain? We have an IDE already. Let's just, let's just build a full-blown uh, GUI for the blockchain with file systems, with compilers, with IDEs, with different applications, clients, all running in the same GUI. Right, so Isaac the game can have a client running in that GUI, and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's quite clear that the notion we're going after is, I think we need an operating system for the blockchain. So Ethereum is this world computer that is very opaque and somewhere distributed. And uh, right now, we need different tools and web apps to interact with it. When we can run an operating system with a GUI, then the blockchain computer has a graphical interface for us to look at. It's, it becomes tangible and visual and tractable. We think that's where the future is headed. And um, if you're interested, let's build it together. Thank you. Hello, I'm Gigi from Topology. Um, we're really happy to help co-hosting the event today, StartNet Vietnam, the first StartNet event in Vietnam. Um, we had a lot of fun building on StartNet and sharing our experiences with the local developer uh, community. But, uh, we're hoping to continue helping and educating the local developers about the potential and st the wonderful future of building on StartNet. Thank you.